Welcome to the GOTA virtual conference. Scan the QR code on the left to participate in our silent auction. The silent auction will run from October 1st to October 29th of 2020. Scan the QR code on the right to go to the GOTA online store. Thank you to our 2020 sponsors, Platinum Level Sponsor, The Shepherd Center, Gold Level Sponsors, All About Kids Therapy Services in the University of St. Augustine, and Silver Level Sponsor, Hangar Clinic. Shepherd Center specializes in medical treatment, research, and rehabilitation for people with spinal cord and brain injury. We see 400 individuals with brain injury a year. We see over 350 individuals with spinal cord injury a year. Our staff have the expertise, we have the knowledge, and our outcomes exceed national averages. works at the Shepherd Center as a dual spinal cord and brain injury specialist in the Atlanta area. In 2017, she was awarded board certification in physical rehabilitation from AOTA, and she became a Resna Certified Assistive Technology Professional, an ATP. She's pursuing Master's of Business Administration and Master's of Healthcare Administration with Georgia State University. We also have Laura Barone. She is a first year pediatric OT at Hope Ridge, a center for children with autism. And she's new to Atlanta from Philadelphia and graduated from Temple University. Welcome to Atlanta. Kelsey Reeves is our current chair of membership committee and our journal club. In addition to GOTA, she works at Northeast Georgia Medical and Shepherd Center. And we also have Lauren Gray who graduated with her OT, OTA degree from Middle Georgia State University in 2009. She is faculty member at Georgia University and she's been teaching for five years. She has been providing teletherapy to the pediatric community and serves as a CODA um, board member for the NBCOT board of directors. So thank you everybody for joining us. Um, really looking forward to this presentation and let's just have you take it away. Hi everyone, so I'm going to share our presentation with you. All right, is so everybody able to see our presentation now? Yes. Good. So we are presenting on addressing the elephant in the chat room, the moral imperative of occupational therapists to produce digital content. Um, Thank you, Amy, for introducing us all. Um, collectively, we are the GOTA membership committee. <clears throat> so the things we're gonna be going over tonight, our learning objectives is the role of YouTube um, for just the general public education, just the role it has on disseminating health information now. Um, the impact this has on our profession as, um, therapy practitioners, as well as how to integrate um, video sources like YouTube into your professional toolkit. So we've created some interactive polls. Um, since we are the mem membership com committee and we make the content for the YouTube channel and help upload your content to the YouTube channel, um, we wanted to get some feedback from you all. So we're gonna start out um, with just how often you watch YouTube. So you can join the poll by going to this website at the top, pollev.com slash Kelsey Reeves 175, or you can text um, Kelsey Reeves 175 to I'm not seeing any full answers yet. I'll give people a second to join. Yes. <clears throat> mm. 
Kristen, do you mind to pull up the presentation for a second? I'm gonna um, check on the poll. Okay, it should be working now. Let's see. There we go. Okay, perfect. All right, I'm going to stop sharing and hand it back over to Kelsey. Okay. All right, can we all see the poll answers now? It's coming in for me. Awesome. <clears throat> all right, so we're getting a lot. And so um, the majority of you are answering frequently as in weekly or sometimes as in monthly. Okay. Sorry, guys, my computer is struggling tonight. There we go. Okay. So let's just talk about the role of YouTube as an educational platform. So YouTube is the primary video platform that people use across the board. This goes for the general public as well as educators. Um, just anyone typically looking for videos starts with YouTube. And people accessing their health information with um, sources like YouTube has only increased over time. There was a study done in 2014, which in internet terms these days was kind of a long time ago, but they looked at um, people's access to health of information on sites like YouTube. And what they found is eight out of 10 internet users were using these online platforms like YouTube to find health information. They also found that patients with chronic illnesses were more likely to use these internet-based sources than any other populations to manage their health conditions. And that not only were people looking to these sites um, for their health information, they were also using this to like guide their decision making and determine how to treat their condition about 70% of the time. So this tells us that YouTube plays a really important role in disseminating our health information. Which sounds great, right? There's more resources out there. We have health, it's easily accessible. We're going to talk later about all the great things about YouTube, but some of the downsides is YouTube isn't fact checked. They don't fact check or require it for any of their publications. And the videos that do um, use fact checking are done by third party sources and they're not endorsed by YouTube. So this gets into the idea of like how reliable is this content? And they looked at there's an analysis of the um, health content on YouTube that found that there's more videos produced and are more frequently viewed that contradict basic healthcare standards um, compared to the videos that are done by reliable sources, from government agencies, professional organizations, and even researchers. The other piece of this is the learning side of it. So um, 2013 looked at a study of millennial student learning and how millennials were um, deciding if their sources were reputable or something that they would use. Um, and they found that they weren't looking at the quality or the validity or the authority of their sources. But what they did use to evaluate a web-based resource was its understandability. I feel like this needs a big like hashtag Wikipedia next to it. Why it's an easily used and frequently read search engine. Um, the amount of information from a source and the accuracy as well as the recency. So when we originally decided to submit this um, topic to the conference, there was no COVID. COVID had not yet hit us. And, um, you know, when we were thinking about this topic, we had several things come to mind. And the first of which was, what's the impact of the, on the profession for everything that Kelsey just mentioned? So 
<clears throat> as we know, um, people that produce content tend to be the drivers of narrative of the narrative. So if you have information con contradicting the basic healthcare standards and professional guidelines that are produced more often, there are the individuals that are actually driving the narrative. So if you have a website that is flashy or is more easily accessible to individuals and more easily navigated, that individual is going to be reaching a much broader um, number of individuals and will have a greater influence than those that might come from more reputable sources but are more clunky to use. Um, and also the, um, you know, what really is the professional obligation for engagement? Um, what is a client-centered approach to the education and what are we really doing here? Now, one of the ironies of this is YouTube's mission statement is um, clearly indicated on the, if you go to about YouTube and YouTube's mission is to give everyone a voice and to show them the world. And um, like my comment to this is, is this really truly regardless of accuracy and safety? So with um, YouTube and with sites in general, when we think about our professional awareness, and so when the GOTA was looking at creating our own YouTube site, we really wanted to make sure that we were keeping uh, recruitment, professional scope, and public awareness in mind. So regarding awareness, we wanted to really demonstrate the diversity of our profession, especially in the state of Georgia, and also just kind of remember that this is the face not only of Georgia's OT Association, but when people look for OT in general on YouTube, we're going to be representing us and um, we really want to keep that in mind. Also the professional scope. We want to be aware of future collaborators and want to make sure that we're always managing, you know, up our peers. Um, if you are looking at other professional sites and you see people that are talking uh, poorly about one another or um, you know, just not managing up a situation, what does that really do for future collaboration when we have to reach, you know, um, across the office or um, nationally across different stages? And then finally, public awareness. We really want OT to remain synonymous with our scope of practice. So ADLs, hands, and all of those major things. Now, this is the part that really, um, I think is, has really come to the forefront and really is what made me interested in this topic. Um, when we think of the ethical and moral obligation of having a YouTube site or for engaging, engaging digitally, we really want to promote content that is professionally based in terms of references, opinions, resources, um, and guidelines. And we want to change the narrative. So what's really disturbing is uh, one of the studies, the hyperlink is below um, underneath the gut tefix, 49% um, of Americans surveyed agreed with one of the six main conspiracy theories, which are listed on a different slide, but really this results in decreased adherence to professional and medical advice. And um, I really want to explore this uh, duty to respond. So when we think of um, an individual that might be, we find them hurt in the community, you know, typically we have a duty to respond professionally as healthcare workers that are trained in CPR. Um, and then if you are not a healthcare worker, you're still protected by good Samaritan laws. So when we have this call for um, conference submissions, we really wanted to emphasize this concept, right? Um, and that it wasn't just enough for professional organizations to have um, a website. And we can't just leave this like tech stuff and the outreach to bloggers or independent clinicians or um, like the Instagram models or the tech industry to regulate these things. Um, you know, we really want to be out there at the forefront, as it was mentioned earlier in the presentation. We know that um, the general public tends to get a lot more of the antidotal evidence uh, supplied to them in a really like a copious amount. So we wanna make sure that we're looking at professional guidelines, which maybe aren't published as frequently, but we wanna make sure that we have multiple ways of giving this information both to other clinicians, our partners in practice and um, their, um, our clients. So uh, we just really wanna think about if this were you know, in the community and we found an individual, we would have a duty to act. How come in uh, digital content, we don't have a duty to act as a profession? And is that something that really needs to change? So on the screen here are actually those, some of them are the six, um, are the multiple conspiracy theories or, um, you know, multiple theories that were perpetuated. So one of the ones that I, um, think that makes this such a timely topic is, so we had this idea, right, when we were first writing the, the proposal, and then lo and behold, COVID hits, and what do we see? So initially, um, we didn't see a lot of response from 
um, you know, the platforms initially, but suddenly within a couple of days or weeks of COVID hitting the United States, we started seeing a rapid response by the tech industry and by individuals that have platforms. Now, we are obviously not Google, but it is important to note that large um, platforms were actually using this as an opportunity to perpetuate accurate healthcare information. So I have a snippet here of what pops up when you Google the coronavirus, and that is actually um, a health warning. So that little triangle there in the word health information, and then it indicates the symptoms, prevention, and treatment, and it comes from reputable sources. And then on the left hand of the column, it actually regulates where you're getting the overview statistics and health information. Now you can scroll past this and ignore that information and then go to any other websites that may promote uh, less accurate information or, you know, single subject reporting, you know, or somebody's blog. But in general, you're getting the compiled healthcare literature from a reputable source first. So what is really interesting about this is it begs the question of, you know, what would have really happened if this had been the way that we addressed other um, non-accurate, uh, you know, fringe theories. So the one that I really want to dive into is one I think most of us have heard quite a bit about. But what would have happened if we had taken into account the digital duty to respond or Good Samaritan laws, and this had been applied to other topics, not just COVID-19, um, and most notably for this, we're going to use vaccination as, as an example. So if the general public had had a more unified response to the Andrew Wakefield study regarding vaccinations and autism, such as a banner ad, a pop-up window, or some other warning appearing when um, people had visited sites regarding vaccine information, um, not just ones regarding autism, but if we had noticed that this was starting to sweep the world, if we had started having warning signs come up, um, you know, would that have changed the outcome of things? Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar, um, in 1998, Andrew Wakefield and 12, 12 other of his colleagues published a case series in The Lancet that MMR vaccines were linked to um, developmental disabilities in children. This um, was despite a very small sample size, a poor design, and the speculative nature of the conclusions that he wrote up. The narrative gained a lot of traction. Um, it had the help of some celebrity influencers and a population of individuals that um, I see this often with my background in um, catastrophic care. Uh, individuals that have chronic um, presentations of different things tend to be more susceptible to um, you know, exhausting all possible avenues for care. And so this, uh, in this group of parents of children with autism and groups that were concerned about that, they are very susceptible and were susceptible to this information. And so it gained a lot of traction. Um, so, you know, between 1998 and 2008, we saw widespread measles outbreaks. And um, in that time when we were experiencing all these outbreaks, Andrew Wakefield was exposed for having committed fraud, um, having multiple uh, financial conflicts of interest, multiple ethical, ethical violations specifically regarding that study. And the article was retracted by the Lancet. Um, Andrew Wakefield eventually lost his medical license, not just in the UK, but had it actually um, had other countries file um, whatever type of regulatory um, statements indicating that he was not to practice there. So it just kind of demonstrates the long-term ramifications that one individual can have on a platform. And in this case, it was the Lancet and then picked up by news organizations, but it just shows you how, you know, one bit of misinformation or maybe um, it is a reputable source, but it's taken out of context can have huge, huge ramifications. So we really thought of, um, you know, we are obviously not the coronavirus in Google, or the Lancet, but you know, if we have a platform, shouldn't we use it? And what's our ethical obligation? So now to kind of look at YouTube use in OT practitioner education. So both in OTs and for OTAs, because right now we're getting a whole new generation of students in, even though I just graduated in 2009, which to me doesn't seem that long ago. The students we have now in our educational programs are a completely whole new generation of students. They're actually coming from the digital generation where they grew up with iPads, iPhones, um, iPod touches and all of that. And so they're used to getting the majority of their information from those YouTube channels. So as educators, we have that ethical obligation to adapt and we have to meet these students where they're at. 
So looking at YouTube use in the classroom, it's really interesting because it gives us that multi-sensory way to get that information out to the students instead of just standing up there and having us lecture in front of them um, from a PowerPoint slide or anything like that, because it gives them, it almost takes the context of a picture um, is worth a thousand words. Um, but in this case, a video can be worth a thousand words because they can actually see what the educator is talking about. So it's going to provide that multi-sensory way to get that information to them. Um, that learning is going to increase when that instruction is integrated using those multimedia tools. We know as therapists that we don't just want to hit um, our patients and our students just by showing them something. We want to show them, we want to tell them, we want to have them do it. Um, they want to hear it and all of that. So we're hitting all of those multi-sensory categories. So it shows um, the students are going to learn more by using that. And then actually 71% of students believe that that video use increases their attention during the lectures. So it's going to reduce that classroom time that we have to spend on explaining things more in depth. Um, if you can just show them with those videos and then it's going to improve that exam performance. So that was looking at it from a student perspective, but then looking at it from an educator responsibility as OTP educators, what are we called to do meeting these students where they're at. So by using those videos, we're engaging them in more critical and creative ways. We're not just having a PowerPoint slide or just a lecture. We're adding all of those things and we're meeting them right there where they're at. So we have that obligation as a university to endorse those quality educational videos and those YouTube channels and endorse them as a program, as an institution. Because if you just go to Google and you Google sensory, there's probably going to be 50 million things that pop up. The majority of those may not even be from an OT practitioner or someone who even really knows what they're talking about. So when our students then Google that, maybe they're in the pediatric class, and I use that because that's what I teach, but um, and they go and Google that and try to find that information, we can't verify that the quality of information that they're getting is legit. So as educators, we really need to take that first step to endorse some of those videos. And we can even do that by either creating our own content for classes. That way, it's a lot of work up front, but we've created that content. They're able to watch it. We know the quality of the information that's in there or go through and vet some of those videos. And you can actually create your own YouTube playlist that are based off of a structured lesson plan or topic. So that way the students would be assigned a topic and can go through that video list that boosts that information that you're talking about. Um, it's a lot of work up front, but once you do it, it's very beneficial. And then especially during COVID right now, it has been huge because Educators are having such a hard time. Students are not going on level one field work like they typically do. So, and um, sometimes we're even doing it a hybrid model where we're having to do lectures from our office or from home and the students are at home. So we're not able to show them a lot of the hands-on things. So being able to have that content that's um, reputable that we are able to endorse, then that way you're able to put that forward and ensure that what the students are getting is um, accurate. So we wanted to see if any of you guys have ever made a YouTube video. <clears throat> Okay, so 43% yes, 57% no. Um, it's actually easier than you think. And um, that's what the membership committee is also here to do is to support you guys. If you have an idea or a thought or something in practice or you're an educator and, oh, changing the screens. Okay, so a little more on the yes. Um, or something you want to produce but don't um, know how, we're here to help you guys um, produce that content as well.
So what about how many of you have visited the GOTA YouTube channel? And not to worry if you have it, we're gonna take you there tonight. Okay, good. So 70% yes, that's awesome. So this, we are going to now bring you to the GOTA website. Um, this is where you will log in with your GOTA account and you can access the GOTA YouTube channel. Um, so here is all of the wonderful videos that are on the channel so far. Um, some of there's um, the OT and COVID-19 um, field report videos. Those are very informational. Um, and a lot of people have submitted videos with, on different topics, things about journal club, telehealth updates. Um, so if you guys wanna go on and look at any of those, they are very informative and reliable content. And this is the um, a video from the GOTA website that Kelsey made. Hello, hello. I'm happy to welcome you to the Georgia Occupational Therapy Association YouTube channel. I'm Kristen Weber. I'm an occupational therapist who lives in the Atlanta region and specializes in catastrophic care. I'm your current chairperson to the membership committee. And I'm excited to introduce you to the rest of the committee members tonight as we review the Go to YouTube channel mission. In addition to reviewing the mission statement, this video will also cover why the committee decided to use YouTube as our platform, the benefits of tuning in, and how to submit new content. So let's jump right in. The mission of the YouTube channel is to increase membership participation through a grassroots campaign. Channel puts members first by promoting a platform for engagement. Members are encouraged to create content, determine the topics for the membership committee to cover, and to tune in for timely and relevant information. Hi everyone and welcome to the GOTA YouTube channel. My name is Lauren Gray and I'm an occupational therapy assistant. My background is in pediatrics, specifically school system based pediatric therapy. I live in the Middle Georgia region and I also work and teach at Middle Georgia State University in the Occupational Therapy Assistant Program. I also serve on the GOTA Membership Committee. When we were brainstorming ideas to increase membership and participation in GOTA, we came up with the idea to create the YouTube channel. The different GOTA regions within the state of Georgia are so spread out, it makes it difficult for our empty practitioners to interact with each other. Our goal was to find a way to benefit our GOTA members while sharing the wealth of knowledge that GOTA has to offer in an easily accessible way. By providing information and content through a web-based platform, we're able to reach practitioners who may have difficulty attending in-person GOTA events. YouTube is a very user-friendly platform and it's going to allow us to share information with our GOTA members statewide. We look forward to sharing with you everything that GOTA has to offer. Hi, I'm Kelsey Reeves, and I currently live in the North Georgia region and practice in acute care and inpatient rehab. Our goal with this channel is to create opportunities for learning and problem solving with other OT practitioners from all over the state. We plan to post everything from in-depth continuing ed courses, to current research and evidence-based interventions, and even some quick reviews and study strategies for students. We are here to help you further your practice. Hello, my name is Adrienne Smiley. I am an occupational therapist and a member of the Georgia Occupational Therapy Association. I would like to thank you for watching our YouTube video. The steps for submitting content are as follows. Feel free to record content with your computer, phone, 
or through professional equipment. If using a phone, please remember to hold the phone in a horizontal position or in landscape mode. Recording vertically or in portrait mode can be difficult to edit and view later. When you submit your content, please provide the following. Video title, names of those in the video, names of those who produce the video, and a short description of the video. If the video should be shared as is, or if edits are needed, please indicate this when you submit your content. If the video needs to be combined or shortened or formatted in some way, please also include this information. You should send your materials to kristen.jean.weber at gmail.com or via Dropbox in the link that is provided. Thank you so much and we look forward to your submissions. Okay, so to go into a little more about the main functions of YouTube and how to get started, um, like we've said, it's a very user-friendly and free-to-use service. Um, you can just make an account and you can search for, watch, and subscribe to videos. And then YouTube has this alg algorithm that populates to your interests based on searches. Um, so that's where if you're typing in occupational therapy, hopefully GOTA will come up because more people will watch and subscribe to our channel. Um, you can create personal channels and as a content creator, you then obtain subscribers and that's how it increases the views and popularity, um, which is important for the GOTA to continue to have people watching our content because it's reliable and it will gain popularity for the channel and when people go on YouTube on their browser. So um, uh, like we've said before, it is YouTube use for OT students and public is very important right now, especially during COVID. Um, it is It offers an interactive learning platform that has been essential um, for resources for either education or telehealth. Um, it's the primary video platform that people are using and it's the most user friendly so everybody can find what they need and hopefully are looking at resourceful information. Um, another important thing that OTs can use is advocating for the profession to the general public, um, get the word out about what OT is, how we help and the different settings that we work in and the diversity that we bring to the profession. All right, so what do we see from other state associations regarding the use of YouTube and digital content? When we decided to do this presentation, we really wanted to survey the field. And so this is what we found. Nine out of the 50 states had occupational therapy um, association YouTube channels. It is important to note that one state had um, the student run channel. Uh, so the state actually did not have the general clinicians or their board of the geo of their state association run it. And I believe it was Ohio. They had um, the student association take care of the channel entirely. And then it would actually hand off between student associations each year from all of that state's schools. So that was a little bit different. Um, I think most of us know the AOTA has their own YouTube channel as well. And the AOTA had a very coordinated response to COVID-19. A lot of organizations took after what the national organizations did in response to COVID-19. And since it was, a, it, it was a pandemic, individuals actually took down their membership firewalls. And so we followed suit. So the GOTA on our YouTube channel, any content that was regarding um, COVID-19 uh, or how to treat individuals that were impacted with COVID-19, we put in front of our membership wall. So individuals could access the information on the GOTA website, and on our GOTA YouTube channel, not by logging in, but just by searching for us. Um, so if you guys have not seen it, the GOTA uh, had that coordinated response. And as Laura showed us earlier, those were the videos that were created. I do wanna highlight that right now, our current numbers stand at 70 total videos created, 32 of which are public videos. 
Uh, we have 68 subscribers, so not a ton. So everybody go to the GOTA YouTube channel and subscribe. Um, and then some, for those of you that might not know, subscribers are individuals that when they hit the like button or the subscribe button, or um, I think it's an alarm on YouTube, every time the GOTA posts a new YouTube video, you'll actually get, um, you know, uh, an alert and it'll like pop up in your, um, you know, on the corner of your screen or wherever it is that you get your alerts. Um, I think this is kind of fun. Our top video, and it has been since it was posted, is um, Kelsey's scrotal sl sling quick fix. Um, and you can actually look up by the video because YouTube has really in-depth um, analytics information. So we can actually look up as the organizers for our YouTube channel where the individuals are finding our content. And Kelsey's scrotal sling video that she posted is actually linked to a lot of other uh, organizations that are referencing that video and hyperlinking it back or ch choosing at the end of their videos. You can choose icons at the end of your video that says suggested content or um, you know how the matrix will kind of show up of all the different videos of similar topics that Laura was referencing. They can actually select, if you're a certain level of um, uh, content producer, you can select which videos it refers people to. So um, people are actually choosing Kelsey's scrotal sling quick fix uh, for their content, which is amazing because it is a it's a great video. If you haven't seen it, it's short. Um, the GOTA, I know we've referenced it a few times, but we really focused on getting information out rapidly to the OT community regarding uh, COVID-19. First, we had our telehealth uh, town hall uh, led by our telehealth task force. And then we recreated um, resource lists in review of practice guidelines, explanations of the stages of COVID, and then finally completed interview series with um, areas in the country that, where the pandemic broke out first. So we focused on these um, spots so that way individuals that were experiencing how to treat those patients could actually connect with us in Georgia who had not experienced the pandemic yet. So all of the initial videos regarding COVID-19 field reports came from individuals in New York City and then focused on the West Coast since that's where the next big outbreak was in Washington. And then I know it sounds like forever ago, but then actually the next hotspot ended up being Michigan. So we spoke with a woman in Ann Arbor who was treating COVID-19 patients and then finally um, focused on clinicians in Georgia. So it just speaks to how powerful this is as a social, social media platform and um, the type of things that state associations and national associations can do to harness it. So um, my last takeaway regarding the impact on the state associations, I think right now we're at a, a tipping point, uh, you know, nationally and internationally that information distribution is really important. And when we think of what state and professional associations do, um, you know, we have the ability to act swiftly if we want to. I know publication is incredibly important and there's a reason why the publication process goes through the stages it does. Um, but, you know, when we look at things like affordability and rapid response to, to situations, what can we do as state associations and as state members and as licensed individuals to respond in um, an ethically and, um, you know, appropriate way? What is our duty to respond? Okay, I'm not sure where these um, responses are coming from, but um, what content would you guys like to see more of on the YouTube channel? So I see practice ideas, treatment ideas. Okay, pediatric content. That's a um, content area I um, have tried to get more information out there on. Fabrication of splints. Okay. Man, shit. I'm going to take some screenshots here. You can also check out it later. But um, mental health assessments, intervention approaches, seating. These are all great topics. Telehealth, treatment ideas, and peds. Okay, that's good. I like it. These are awesome, guys. Um, I know that the PEDS ones has been a challenge to find um, people to produce that content. And since I don't work in PEDS, it's been difficult. But um, yeah, if you guys have also videos or ideas, um, I would love to share. But I'll reach out to find more things. Promotion for numbers, new research content, 
education practice with diverse groups. These are all great things. <clears throat> all right, I think we got most of them. I love this app. All right. What other ways would you guys like to engage with member, like other GOTA members? So right now, like the regionals are having their virtual meetings. We have journal clubs. Um, obviously the YouTube channel, I miss, I know everybody misses in person. It's just not the same. Facebook. Yeah, we've gotten a lot of um, feedback on having some social media, um, other social media sites. So we're working on that as well. Virtual meetings for each reason. Okay, just like a virtual like meet and greet kind of hangout with or like more topic based Slack groups. DOT store. Yay. Both. Okay. By location in the state. Yeah. You guys all have ready now. Share resource folders of open content sources. Okay. Discord. I, uh, I don't know that we're at the point of a Discord or a Twitch um, <laughs> channel, but you never know. Um, I think that is, that's, if we end up having a, um, a virtual platform for competing, that'd be great. Yeah. Virtual meeting, topic discussions with breakout sessions. I know um, the virtual meeting and topic just with like breakout discussions. Um, we talked about like long-term that being a plan. Um, Lauren, may, you may be able to elaborate more on that with like the AOTA, um, similar to how they, they set it up. Yeah, AOTA has communities of practice um, that get together and they meet monthly. And essentially what they do is they're a work group between practitioners who share a common area um, I'm currently a member of the transitions community of practice. And so we meet monthly on alternating days each month. Um, that way the most people can get together and all of that, but we kind of share ideas and we focus on a goal of what do we want to accomplish? Um, do we want to disseminate information over the topic? Do we, um, things like that. So I know we've talked before about having like um, task force here in the state of Georgia or our own communities of practice where if there's a practice area like maybe it's school-based pediatrics um, and then kind of decide what are some issues that school-based OTs and OTAs are facing right now and then kind of identify those and then kind of work towards okay what are we going to do about it how are we going to tackle these and do that so we have talked about doing that if anybody would be interested. I like the idea of meeting by practice areas too. Great ideas, thanks guys. All right, so I think we, there we go. This is our contact information. Um, if you wanna contact any of us or if you wanna reach out about um, creating content, um, it's also on the GOT website um, under the YouTube channel, how to, um, you saw in the video how to make content, but it's also there if you want to review for any of that. And here are resource references. Does anybody else have any questions or comments? My comment is fantastic. <laughs> I can't wait to learn more. Well, what's a transition group? But I'll just I'll just email Lauren. That sounds is that transition like like 
from talking about like transition kids. from high school and right. then on for Perfect. kids. So it's awesome. No questions at all. Well, I could say uh, it might be nice. You know how they have those YouTube videos on on slang. Uh, you said Slack and Discord, and you said something else, and I'm like, I, I gotta get that that, uh, that lexicon down, that jargon. I don't know <laughs> what you're talking about. <laughs> right? <laughs> I was unsure of Discord too. <laughs> Thanks, Kristen, for jumping in. <laughs> yeah, Slack and Discord a lot of times are used by gamers, but they've actually been picked up by a lot of um, virtual fitness individuals. So you'll see people um, using uh, Swift, which is like a biker, a competitive biker app, and they'll be on both Slack and Discord to interact with their um, communities. So it's a way of engaging one another. So we could do find motor group and we could all be virtually engaging on Slack and Discord. Oh, that's cool. So it'd be like a competition. Yeah, yeah, you could do, um, I know at one point we had talked about doing a video on like, um, you know, for OT month doing a, um, I can't remember what you called it, Kelsey, like one of your organizations had done it. It was like a relay or like a, the Olympics, like using a sock aid. There were multiple things that were adaptive aids and typical things OTs did and that, or taught people to do like putting on a shirt, one sleeve, and then you had to get through the relay course. So theoretically we could have everybody streaming their capacity to complete these tasks Why um, provide commentary. <laughs> you know what I was thinking, a World OT Day is on um, October 27th. We should see who can, uh, like who, who could connect with another OT in another country or who do you know? <laughs> I actually, um, this is like totally random side note, but I thought was interesting and I wanted to share it with other OTs. I was talking to an OT, to an OT who's um, in the UK and we just got on the topic of COVID and life and how they were doing in response and stuff. And they are creating little um, like mobile COVID rehab centers that are just specific for rehab, OTPT speech, um, and um, people like who have um, like either still COVID positive or been COVID positive. And they're just like these mobile um, rehab hospitals that are like popping up all over, which I thought was really cool. I was very excited about it. That's amazing. Yeah. Right? Um, I know this is a, a shameless plug, but um, I'm part of the Makers Making Change community. Uh, so if you've got, if you ever get a chance to look that up, um, but their whole thing is uh, open um, access and shared content. And so if you if you Google any of their resources, it's how to print things. And so they'll make devices like Kelsey's explaining for uh, to mail to people though for them to be able to do you know access things at home or other things of that nature. Wow. They've put on some really cool things to make um, adaptive masks for sip and puff drivers. I have several people oh, no. using them. <laughs> well, it's good to see you all. It was great. Thank you so much. A lot of information. <laughs> In the short Thank you for doing time. this. Thank you very much. It was very informative. <laughs> Thank you guys. Y'all did great. See you guys. Good night. Thank you. Y'all have a good night. Enjoyed it. Thank you.